philosophy yeah. underlying the American political system. And for that, we have to uh, look at the, probably the most important document, political document in American history, and that's often un undervalued and overlooked, and that's the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were written by uh, the trio of Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay. They wanted to um, reform the Articles of Confederation that served as our first constitution from 1781 after Yorktown. That was the final battle of the American Revolution in 1781 until 1788. So they went to Philadelphia in the spring and summer of 1787 and wrote this new constitution. But then it had to go back to the American people for acceptance. So they were fearful that the American people uh, wouldn't accept it. So, so basically what happened was is that they wrote advertisements and um, to try to explain to the American people what the new constitution was all about. And then they bought space in the newspapers in, in the country and uh, they wanted to quell whatever fears the American people had. Later on, all those advertisers were brought together, and now they're called the Federalist Papers. They're called the Federalist Papers because they wanted to take the old system under the Articles of Confederation, which is a confederation. Confederation is a loose amalgamation of independent entities into one country, which is really not a country, but it's kind of like a voluntary group, and make it into a federal system where there's more centralized power. The reason they feared that the American people wouldn't accept the new federal system is because the Americans living under the motto, don't tread on me, were very anxious about, uh, about political power, having lived under George III, the English monarchy. So that's what the Federalist Papers are. And they had to write in language that people could understand about the advantages of federalism over confederation. And because they were written so well and they got to the heart of the matter, they stand as the most important explanation of how the American political system works, because it hasn't changed basically at all. And then in 1788, the American people, uh, they got the required nine out of the 13 states to accept the new constitution and it was inaugurated. And George Washington became president, was chosen as president in 1789, March of 1789. So if you really want to know what this political system is that hasn't changed in 230 years, you have to go to the Federalist Papers, and they're just not studied very much. It's a shame, it's a shame. and most people really don't know about the underlying principles of American government as a result. So an odd thing was happening from 1781 to 1788 under the Articles of Confederation because it was highly decentralized. The states were ruling themselves. And within each state, a majority of the citizens were ruling those states. Now, what group constituted a majority? They were small farmers. So let's look at what small, the kind of life that small farmers led in from 1781 to 1788. The revolution had ended at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. Cornwallis surrenders as the last remaining large British army he surrenders to Washington. So many of those four small farms were led by soldiers who were in the colonial army. And as you may have learned in high school, they weren't paid. So their wives had to take out loans from banks and from other creditors, rich <coughs> large farmers. But, but these soldiers coming back to their farms couldn't repay the loans because they weren't paid. So uh, here comes the creditors, including banks, and they want to repossess the land and farms. Many of those farms had been in their family already for hundreds of years since 1788. Go back to the beginning of the 17th century. 
So there, there were rebellions among the small farmers trying to force the state, state legislatures, in some cases successfully forcing the state legislatures, to go off the gold standard and start printing paper money. Now can you figure out why? It goes back to the law of supply and demand. When demand is constant, there's always a constant demand for money. Increase in supply produces a decrease in value. So if, if the majority of small farmers in the states could convince the state legislatures to, to start printing up paper money, they would still own, oh, let's say $100. But the $100 paid with paper wouldn't be worth the $100 paid for in gold. Is everybody following what I'm saying? In other words, what the small farmers wanted to do was inflate the economy. Any questions on that? Not yet. Any questions at all? Got a question? Question? But the creditors who made up the famous 1% naturally didn't want to do that, but they were being overrun. And these rebellions took place in all the states. What was the most famous of the rebellions that we read about in high school? Shades Rebellion. Where did that take place? Massachusetts. And a former officer in the colonial army, Daniel Shays, led the rebellion. They marched on Springfield, which at the time was the capital of Massachusetts. And this was happening in one form or another in almost all of the states. <coughs> okay? So what what was occurring was that the small farmers in Massachusetts all had the same interests. Not only were they all facing their farms being repossessed by banks and creditors, for 1%, but they were basically of the same religion. You understand? So social, political, and economic, they had almost everything in common. So the group representing the creditor class the Federalists felt that something had to be done about this, both to protect their own economic interests, but also for the country, because the 13 states were being torn apart by this, these insurrections and instability. Okay? So what they're proposing is, is that we'll set up a federal system which centralizes the government more and gives more power to a president, a Congress, with a House of Representatives and Senate, and a federal judiciary. And the theory was that if you centralize the government, you'd still have small farmers in Massachusetts with debts, and you'd still have small farmers, let's say, in South Carolina with debts. But now that they're being brought together under one banner, one government, they wouldn't be of the same religion. They might have the same economic interests, but in terms of politics and society, they'd be different. And although it would be easier for small farmers in one state, say Massachusetts, to coalesce into a faction and be successful in lobbying the state legislature to do their bidding. In other words, the majority would rule as it's supposed to in a democracy. It would be more difficult in a more centralized government for the farmers in Massachusetts to agree with the farmers in South Carolina, etc. So, for example, what would be one big issue that would uh, separate the farmers' interests from Massachusetts and South Carolina? I chose those two states for this reason. What would be one big issue that would separate them? So, despite the fact that they were all debtors, despite the fact that they all wanted paper money, they couldn't have the same powerful majority nationally because of an issue like, for example, slavery. There you go. See? So, this is a very very interesting strategy, isn't it? To weaken the power of the majority, you have to nationalize and change a confederation into a federal system. So let's stop. Is, there, is this clear to everybody? Question for me? What's the name of that rebellion? 
Shays Rebellion. His name was Daniel Shays. S H A Y S. So Shays Rebellion has the possessive after the S. No, I just mentioned slavery. Was there another issue? There or? could be many. Remember, they weren't of the okay. same religion, for example. That's true. Right? Slavery but there could be many, one. many <coughs> issues as well. Okay. Huh? Slavery is just the one in the Well, it's one that comes to this one. Yeah. Uh, that's why I use Massachusetts and South Carolina. But even if you use Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, the same thing would occur. It wouldn't be differences on slavery. That's the most dramatic one. But there'd be different religions, etc. Different local feuds. Uh, feuds. Huh? That prevents them. You just said that prevents from them. Pre from from presenting a united front. The best way to understand it is this: the stock market goes down as oil prices go down. Now let's think about this for a second, because this is exactly the same way the Federalists would think. <coughs> There are, I'll just use a large number, a million trillion consumers around the world <laughs> who love gas prices going down, right? And there's 10 CEOs of oil companies and thousands of their workers who are hurt. But pressure is being placed to raise gas prices for those 10 CEOs and thousands of their workers, even though a million trillion people are benefiting from it. Why? Because the million trillion are consumers who have one interest in lowering the price of bread and lowering the price of oil, you got it? But they differ on every other issue. But the 10 CEOs of oil companies, for example, and their thousands of workers have only one interest. And so they're solidified and unified in what they want to get out of governments. Does that answer your question? Are you sure? Question. So that's what it was. Yeah, let me read. I want you to make sure that in my classes that we always do uh, a direct reading. You don't, you don't take, you don't take the, uh, the word of the teacher. So here it is. Let's go to First Federalist number ten. This is what he. This is Madison wrote Federalist number ten. So this is what he says. The smaller the society, and, and again, it, it, I'm going to read it slowly, but you, everyone can understand it. That's why we want to go back to the Federalist Papers to understand what's going on in the American political system. The smaller the society the fewer probably will be the distinct parties and interests composing it. The fewer the distinct parties and interests, the more frequently will a majority be found of the same party. Got it? And the smaller the number of individuals composing a majority, and the smaller the compass, geographical area, within which, within which they are placed, the more easily will they concert, join together, and execute their plans of oppression. Now, why is he called the plans of oppression? Because the creditors, like Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, and the banks are looked upon as being oppressed by the majority who want them to more easily pay their debts by trading a gold-based economy to a paper economy. Are you, are you following me? So that's why he calls it oppression. Because these founding fathers of all the rights are mostly interested in which right? What? Property rights. Life would be in property. Let's make sure we understand that. You know how we talk about the 1% and the 99% hasn't changed. And the 99% have no chance. That's just the way the system works. Extend the sphere. In other words, instead of the government being Massachusetts, now the government is the United States government. You get it? That's the famous quote, extend the sphere. And you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. 
and you make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. Property rights of other citizens. The influence of factious leaders, a faction is an interest group. In this case, he's talking about the majority interest group. Workers. There was no industry to speak of at this time, so workers were small farmers. The influence of factious leaders may kindle a flame within their particular states, but will be unable to spread a general conflagration through other states. Remember, because they don't have the same interests. Isn't this amazing? I mean, it's all right here. You don't have to, all you have to do is read the Federalist Papers. A religion, he gives an example, a religious sect may degenerate into a political faction in a part of the Confederacy, one state where all the small farmers basically are all the same religion. But the variety of sects dispersed over the entire face of a country must secure the national councils against any danger from that source. Because all people aren't of the same religion anymore. A rage for paper money, for an abolition of debts, <laughs> for an equal division of property, or for any other improper or wicked project. It's a wicked project. You want to be able to <coughs> more easily repay your debts. For any other improper or wicked project, will be less apt to pervade the whole body of the Union than a particular member of it, one state, as we tried to explain. In the same proportion as such a malady is more likely to taint a particular county or district than an entire state. It's, it's as clear as can be. And then if you didn't get it yet, they go to uh, Federalist of 51.